are you afraid of things that go bump in the night? Well, if so, you have one man to blame for a lot of the vile things that have been haunting your worst nightmares. Ed Greenwood originally created the Forgotten Realms as a child in 1965 and has been making monsters even longer. He hasn't stopped. Although never officially a staff member at TSR or Wizards of the Coast, during his time working with them and on some of the most popular hobby magazines throughout the years, Ed has either fully imagined or lent hand to creating some of the most iconic ghouls, ghosts, and grooves that modern gamers still adore today. I am Ivan with Many Realms, and today Ed is telling us all about what it's like being the Monster Man. Being the Monster Man. From the cursed to the deep spawn, from the Crawling Claw to the Dracolich, and from the Dark Naga to the Elhoon, or Elithalich, I've created my share of monsters for D&D, uh, more than a hundred at the last count, and ecologized many other beasties, giving them offstage lives, breeding cycles, and the like. My initial reason for doing so, uh, particularly for the look-alike monsters like the Gaspor and the Beholder look-alikes, was to give my player characters new challenges, monsters that they had to think about when they first came across them, rather than remember what they'd memorized from the monster manual so they could defeat a beastie with ease. There were also creature shapes, like the ghost and the beholder and the dragon, that I wanted my player characters to face and fight without suffering the official stated damage that such monsters did. And I wanted to explore that whole we bring back a thingy in a cage, or its egg, or some scales, or organs, or some of its blood, and try to cook or eat them because we're stuck in the underdark for the gods alone know how long until we find a way out, or try to sell them, and how much do we get? or try to use them as spell components, or in our own little alchemical experiments, or to make spell inks. I once ran a delightful little mini-campaign where everyone tried to concoct spell ink formulae and get rich by making and selling the stuff back in the second edition days where spell ink formulae were a vitally necessary part of writing spells down. One more delaying tactic written into the rules to slow magic users down in their march to game balance blasting levels. It was in Scornuvel and featured a cast of thieves, oily merchant traders, rogue wizards you just knew were going to turn around and sell the inks for thrice the price or more when they got to Waterdeep, and spies for the Zentrium and the Wizards of War, uh, that's Cormier's War Wizards, uh, who wanted to seize the secrets of the spell ink formulae. Thing. And that preceding paragraph that I just read is why I give some editors fits. Jeff Grubb used to go through my early manuscripts and prune long passages out and toss them into new files he'd created entitled Ed's Digressions for reuse in some other product later. But digression over, back to the monsters. To delve into critter parts and their uses and values, and leaving aside the ethical questions of that, because that was part of the game right then, and I was writing for the official game right then, not now. One really has to know how the monster reproduces. Does it have eggs at all? If you snatch them from the nest, are their contents dead very soon after? What keeping warm or other handling do they need? To dress the monster's lair, one has to know how it lives, where it prefers to dwell, and how it thinks. Does it prepare traps, multiple escape routes, and back doors to try to hide or try to scare away unwanted visitors with charnel pits and strewn bones or even explicit warning messages or corpse trophies? Hmm? Kim Mohan, back in my days, as a contributing editor of Dragon, a title that later morphed into creative editor and still later faded away altogether, gave me the task of writing ecologies as my first editorial assignment so we could bank game-related content for future issues of the magazine and bring to life many monsters of the game. In some cases, that meant make this monster make sense. <laughs> now, it's one thing to know that a Medusa turns you to stone if her gaze meets yours, and turn herself to stone if you can arrange matters so she sees a reflection of her own eyes. 
But inconvenient questions immediately arise. If all Medusae are female, how does the race survive? And if a Medusa gets close enough to what she wants to eat it, that she can look at it, how is she ever going to get to eat anything but stone? Can she eat stone? Enter the Ecology of the Maedar in issue 106 of Dragon, February 1986, for the benefit of younger readers, in which I invented the male Medusa that can turn things from stone back to flesh so a happy Medusa couple can get some meat or eggs or cauliflower to eat. Note the utility of turning a large meat creature to stone shoving it over a drop so it falls and shatters, then collecting the stony fragments for your larder, turning them back to flesh in these smaller chunks so you have just enough for whoever's dropping by for dinner tonight. Suddenly, the survival of the Medusae as a race doesn't look so imperiled. If you're enjoying this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the little bell icon to be apprised of future videos. I would love that. And I will keep on doing them for you because it's your support that enables me to go on doing these videos. So I'd like to give a big thank you to all of you, my protectors of the realms. Support Ed by going to patreon.com slash edgreenwood for the really good stuff, or get this super sweet unsupervised wizard mug from Ed's shop, link in the description. There were even monsters in the original monster manual that gamers weren't quite certain what they looked like. Did they have wings? Any wings, bat-like, or suffering from forearms? How many legs? Because the original illustrations just didn't show enough of them. In a game where players are always slicing open the bodies of things they've killed and rolling them over and searching their clothing for treasure, if they wear clothing, such gaps in lore couldn't stand. They had to be fixed. And what I very swiftly gained as I explored the life cycles of monsters, penning recipes for baked sturge on toast and dragon soup, and working out long and detailed lists of what alchemical uses could be made of all the parts of, say, a carrion crawler, was a new appreciation for how they shared the realms with such fecund and dominant races as the orcs and humans, both of whom exploded in population and reached to such an extent that most monsters, that is, creatures feared and considered dangerous by those dominant races, either learn to live with humans, like halflings and gnomes, who in the realms are found in strength in almost every human city, or were pushed to the wildest terrain and became rarer. I started to think about the effects and consequences of things that dragons, for example, had to sleep most of the time and for years at a stretch, or they'd have depopulated the entire world long ago, and they'd be dueling each other to death over whatever scraps or captive herds they'd had the foresight to preserve, unless they were standing guard over gates or portals that brought them fresh food in the form of exploring or simply blundering creatures from other planes. That dragons and beholders and elithids and other brainy monsters were probably manipulating humans from behind the scenes, like cattle, or for amusement, or both perhaps even nudging them towards fulfillment of some grand scheme or other. A human breeding program? The idea used in so many old SF stories? That there should be monster kingdoms just as there are human kingdoms, and that some of these would and should involve the ranching of other species and tending crops, subterranean cavern mushroom farms as well as tilled fields, that there were obviously critters, not yet known to published realms lore, that some of the more fearsome monsters ate, or that filled other niches in local ecological systems, swamps, for example, or the vast frozen bits that couldn't be home to just remorhas. Creating new monsters is one of the best ways of tailoring a challenge for a specific place or point in an adventure, so gamers will never stop doing it. After 50 years of writing about the realms and other settings, I'm still at it. Though for a long time now, I've held the view that the most dangerous and fascinating monsters, uh, foes to challenge player characters, that is, are almost always humans. Welcome back, my friends, to the 
Realm Speak segment, and this is where we tackle names, phrases, and words in the realms or in D&D that might be a stumbling hazard for you. We stumble over them so you don't have to. And today we go to an oldie but goodie in the annals of the realms, or as one unfortunate teacher of mine once said, the annals of the realms, and that is the sea-going, vampiric, giant rays known as the Ixitzatchitl. Yes, that's how you pronounce them, with the emphasis, the emphasis, the emphasis on the zatch. Just remember that. It's zatch, man. Years and years ago, Kim Mohan asked me to do a series called The Ecology's Up, exploration of all the critters in D&D, the Monster Manual, so that we understood what their life cycle was. And one of the very first things that I got faced with in the first package of them, and I can't remember what order they ended up published in, because that was up to the editors. They were trying to fill, literally fill space in issues of the magazine in between the ads. So what got run depended on the theme of the, the issue and how much space they had. So at some point early on, they published The Ecology of the Ixit Zatchitl. And I felt, being as I was doing an ecology, which introduced you once again to all the intricate details of this particular critter, the first thing I had to do was tell you to how to pronounce the critter's name. Because if you didn't know how to do that, you weren't going to use it at the gaming table. You were going to go, uh, because uh, they don't know how to say it, and they don't want to appear ignorant. You needed to know how to pronounce them, so I was there for you. Therefore, it's the ecology of the Ixit Zatchin.